Here we are once again. This is a two-part series on infrared photography, uh, <clears throat> something I think everybody is going to be interested in. Uh, we've got John Trotter with us this evening. He uh, has been an accomplished photographer for many decades. Uh, he has moved into infrared uh, photography recently, um, <clears throat> having converted a couple of cameras, and we'll talk about the cameras and so forth. Next week, we have John Dixon on. Now, John Dixon's been involved in infrared photography for probably five or six years that I know of, and he's been doing a lot of work, a lot of experimentation. But for those people that are neophytes, and we all start at the bottom of the, the rung of the ladder, uh, John's going to show you what he's learned in the past few months, and we're going to talk about, show you his workflow and take a look at some of his, uh, his work. So how are you doing, John Trotter? I'm doing well. I'm not sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's good. We're all sort of, we're all sort of hanging in there, aren't we? Yeah, oh. trying to, trying to stay well. Anyway, John, let's, let's start with the cameras that, what, what, you told me that you converted two cameras. Right. Um, what cameras did you convert and uh, where did you send them for conversion? Okay, well, um, let me just step back one step before that. And that is why did I wanna do this um, infrared and go through the process of having cameras converted because you have to dedicate a camera to be infrared. And not only do you have to select it to be infrared, you have to select what kind of filter it's going to have on it. And, and there are a number of filters that use different uh, parts of the spectrum, the infrared spectrum. Um, so there are a number of things you have to decide, but what you, what you can't do is change a converted camera quickly to a, something else. So you can't go back and forth, for example, between normal photography and infrared. Um, although they, now they've got some uh, filters that I think start to get close to that. Um, but I didn't choose to do that. I went with a very standard infrared um, filter. So that's what the conversion is. Basically a company called Life Pixel, which is in Muckleteo, Washington. It's near Seattle. And I'll put the um, link down below. Go ahead. Sorry, there's a link down below. No, I'll, I will put a link down oh, okay. below to the. Uh... Yeah, I didn't. I didn't put that on here, but it's a really good company. I was just talking to the owner today, Daniel, um, to get his help in uh, solving a problem. But and he's very, very responsive and wants to make sure people are completely satisfied. So it's a really good company. It's the company that John Dixon uses as well. In fact, that's. That's why I used it. So I have a Sony, uh, the one I've just done is an Alpha 7 II, Alpha 7 Mark II. So it's a full frame uh, camera that um, I, I bought because um, I like to use Leica lenses. And this um, electronic viewfinder camera allows me to focus through the lens which is a great advantage since my lenses are rangefinder lenses. Um, but I also use Sony lenses and we'll talk about lenses um, and things that happen with lenses when we look at the demonstration. Um, so that's one of the cameras. And then the other camera is the Sony RX100 uh, 7. 7 is the latest model they've got. And that's a point and shoot camera, but it, and it's got a built in non exchangeable lens, but equivalent to 24 to um, 200 millimeters. So if you, if you were using a 35 millimeter as the standard. So it's a very, uh, it's a very good camera and the um, sensor is quite good. And uh, as long as you're not planning to make really large prints, um, it works just fine. And it's got the advantage that it's very small and very quiet. And um, so because it's small, it doesn't weigh very much. So walking around for a few hours with a couple of cameras around your neck um, can be done without any discomfort. Whereas if you're carrying the normal heavy full frame gear, 
um, it can get pretty tiring to walk around with those cameras. So that's how long, does it, how long does it take you to get a camera converted, John? It depends on how busy they are. So when I when I did the um, um, off the um, Alpha Six, the Alpha, the RX one hundred six or seven rather, um, I um, bought the camera from them. So that's what that's a service they'll do. You either have your camera uh, already and you send it to them, or you buy it and send it to them, or you buy it through them, and their price is essentially the same as B and H or Adorama or somebody. Um, and I did have a moment of pause when uh, I realized the camera that I was getting was coming with no warranty from Sony because it was being converted immediately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I have had to have warranty service on cameras before, so I just crossed my fingers and hoped that that would turn out all right. Well, it, it turned out all right. Um, Sony's so, are, are pretty reliable, or, you know. But the, uh, it, and uh, Daniel at uh, LifePixel is just very responsible. Um, so when you deal with people like that, you can have confidence that if there's a problem, they'll work with you to fix it. Um, so um, those are the two cameras that I've um, had converted, the one with the fixed lens and the one with the exchangeable lenses. Okay. Um, um, so it, it, it takes two things to move into infrared. Uh, well, it, it obviously takes a desire to do that, and, and uh, then it, uh, then you've got to send your cameras in, and the, you know the you probably had a couple thousand dollars, or maybe a little bit more, into the expense of you know both cameras. I would I would assume. So, what made you decide to go to infrared? In other words, what was the motivation to? We're all looking for something different, right? But you know, you, you, it's, you, you've made an expenditure that sort of adds right on top of that. So what are your, what are your thoughts? Why do you want to convert? Well, uh, two things. One, um, I wanted to be, have the stimulation of a new way of seeing. And infrared, since you can't see, we can't see in the infrared. So the images that the camera sees are not what we see. Um, and I wanted the, um, sort of stimulation and inspiration that that would provide. Um, so I guess I was getting just not too enthusiastic about continuing to do more of the same. And I wanted to see something different. Um, I, know the, I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and on that basis, uh, it's totally satisfactory because it is different. And so every time I go out then, uh, it's like a, another little journey of discovery. Um, and I don't have a lot of <clears throat> experience yet, so I still take pictures of things just to see how it'll work. Mm -hmm. and now is, are, is this going to be sort of, as you're, as, you, as you're going out and discovering things, are you sort of tying this back into some kind of project that you're seeing that would fit, uh, would be applicable to infrared? Yeah, so the first, um, I live in Albuquerque, as you know, and um, near where I am, um, we have a forest of cottonwood trees that um, is on both sides of the Rio Grande River. And the forest is called the Bosque, the um, Spanish word for forest. And the um, trails through the Bosque, um, are really quite wonderful. They've, they've thinned the forest, so you see a lot of tree trunks. And um, there are shrubs um, in the understory, and there's a canopy of, of leaves. And I was walking through, um, I mean, I walk through it all the time, walking through looking at the foliage um, and thinking, this could be really neat and infrared, because what you'd see is the dark tree trunks connecting light below in the foliage that's on the ground with light above, which is the leafy canopy. Um, and I thought, okay, I can sort of image that, but in my mind, but I, I want to take pictures of that and see what it actually looks like. So that was a, that was a project, um, not a very 
extensive project, but it turned out to be very rewarding. So that was um, the, that was the start. I was okay. thinking I wanted to see what this would look like in infrared, and so, that remains the stimulus. I was going to say, why don't we take a look at your procedure now, John? And is, that, is that better? Yes, that's fine. That's fine, John. Okay. Um, so when you bring the image in, and uh, when you when you get your camera converted, um, as a part of the price you pay for the conversion is to have a session with a an infrared expert named Dan Wampler. Um, he doesn't work for LifePixel, but he works uh, as a contractor with LifePixel. So you, you spend a half an hour with him talking about um, the initial processing. And um, that was very useful. So the camera comes um, set at a um, white balance, although white balance is a meaningless term when you're looking at infrared, but it's set in such a way that it's, um, it does have some color in it. And what you want to do when you bring it into Lightroom um, or, bring, or whatever your uh, raw converter is, um, you want to be able to have some color control um, because even though all of what I'm doing is going to end up in black and white, the ability to control the black and white tones depends on having some color in the image. So it comes into Lightroom and then I edit it in uh, Photoshop, um, you know, do whatever I, I want in Lightroom, uh, but then open it in Photoshop so, so John, just uh, to interrupt you for a minute, there's really nothing you do in Lightroom other than catalog it and open it up. Is that correct? That's mainly, that's mainly what I do. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Super. So, um, so this is the raw photo coming in from uh, the camera or the DNG uh, file or the uh, whatever the raw file is. So now it's in Photoshop. Okay. Come to catalog it and maybe crop it or whatever you might want to do, and then. Correct. And then you edit in Photoshop, and that's where we're at now. Exactly. Okay. So then I'm going to do image. There's a function called auto color, okay. which basically is either curves or, or levels in Photoshop, but it's set with some parameters that are going to not clip the whites and the blacks and find a neutral midtone and then set the colors based on those things. So. Now you can see oh. things that were all red before are blue right. or bluish, and the sky is a little green blue. Um, so that step one is you just adjust the color, but I mean, you can adjust the contrast and the tonalities as well. Um, I don't like to do very much of that right at the beginning because, um, you know, when, if you start with a high contrast image, it's hard to work back from that. Uh -huh. uh, at least I find that because it's so compelling uh, to keep that contrast high. Um, but it's not the way I want to end up with prints. So I don't like to do that. So then the other thing is that there's something called channel mixer. Um, and which I don't know if people use that very much. People who work in color do tend to use that more. So then basically I've got the output channel red and I'm gonna set the red to zero and the blue to 100% in that output channel red. And then I'm gonna to go to the blue channel and reverse that. I'm gonna set it at zero and 100. Um, so now we've got an image that's got blue in the sky and a lot of neutral colors around um, and I'm going to convert this to black and white but before I do I want to point out something you can see this red red zone right in here uh-huh so the lenses um, have internal reflections that work um, against you in infrared so you end up with hot spots. And I've, I've tried a number of lenses and some are such that you can barely see it. And it depends on 
the length of the lens and the aperture, but some of them are quite prominent. Um, and when I first read about it, I thought that's a, that's a killer. I mean, why would you do that if you are gonna end up having to adjust for all of these hotspots, but it actually turns out not to be such a big deal. Um, so I'm gonna just do um, black and white in Photoshop uh, because it works perfectly well. And you can uh -huh. see now you didn't, you don't see that red spot anymore, right? But it's still red. So it allows you to adjust, oh, okay. you know, the, um, how, what you want to do with that. You want to make it darker or lighter. Um, this is where you can adjust the sky with the adjusting the blues down. Uh, and the cyans. So this is where you just make your own aesthetic choices of how you want this to look. And then now you've got the image, a black and white image in Photoshop that um, you can work on the way your normal workflow would go, whatever you do. So that, that's all there is to it. That's it. And so you apply your own aesthetic kind of, you know, mumble jumble and uh, yeah. okay. That, now, that. when you do your, um, if you do this conversion and then you work with Dan Wampler, um, he really dislikes uh, Lightroom. Um, and his conviction is that if you're using a Sony camera, you should be bringing, you, you should use the raw converter that comes from uh, Capture One. Oh yeah, okay. Free Sony download for Capture One. Um, and, and then you can work on each image with more control of the initial color balance. Um, so he was quite convincing when I worked with him that that was important. So I downloaded the program and then I tested a lot of images, both bringing them into Lightroom and bringing them into Capture One. and I couldn't tell there was enough difference to make it worthwhile. And it's a lot, lot slower um, and it adds steps to my workflow. So I just use Lightroom. Just use, I've got Capture yeah. One in case, there might be a case when I would need it, but I don't yeah. know what. And it, and it seems like this is an extremely easy workflow. So John, I, let's see some of the, the photos. Let's get to your screen and see a couple of the photos that you've completed. This image is quite dramatic. Right. Um, obviously, not your normal view. Right. Um, and so I'm, what I'm going to do is select that to there and go to slideshow. Right. So can you see that? Yep. And did it change? It's the same. Yeah, now it's changed. Now it's changed. Okay. okay. So this is for when I first got the camera. I just took a walk around my neighborhood, the little camera, the um, the RX oh, one hundred. One hundred seven, right? Yeah, and um, so you can see the leaves on the tree, in the places where it's catching sunlight, and and it's mainly foliage that is brilliant in infrared because foliage has a lot of infrared that's reflected from it, green leaves. They absorb a lot of UV, but they reflect infrared. So you end up with a, a lot of um, infrared in, in, um, light being reflected from, the, from foliage. And most, if you were to take pictures of walls and things that don't have um, leaves and don't have other foliage, it doesn't, you won't see very much, at least not with this standard filter that I, I have. Um, it may be that, that when um, you talk with John Dixon, he may have some experience that um, goes beyond that. And there are people who do color uh, infrared, including Dan Wampler, the guy who does the uh, workshop. Um, and, but I haven't done it. So, so these are just black and white images that are produced by the 
workflow I just showed you. Right. And um, so this, this, I thought these are weeping willow trees, a very unusual tree for Albuquerque. For Albuquerque. And um, I took the, this photo and then I, I contacted my neighbor who lives in this house. The two, it's a couple, they, and they both came from Poland. They have a wonderful yard with the weeping willow trees. So I gave her a print of, of this um, image, which she was very happy with. And this is uh, just walking in the bosque near my house. Yeah, okay. And this the, again, walking along and you can see the, the foliage that lines the, um, the canal here. It's a kind of irrigation canal. Right. So this is all white because yeah. it's brilliant infrared. And then the cloud is all brilliant yeah. because it's white. I don't, I don't know that it's got a lot of infrared, but. I think it's an unusual shot. And I think what you're showing the audience is that um, uh, a lot, uh, a lot, a lot of different things or a lot of different photographs can be made with, uh, with infrared. It sort of stretches your, um, uh, your creativity or, it, you know, it makes it, you can, there's more you can do, especially where you live, John, where we live in Arizona, you got that yeah. bright sunlight, which, you know, makes these photographs, uh, you know, just really jump out and you've got the green of the, of your desert and your, your brush and so forth. That's super. Yeah. So th that's basically it. Um, okay. Let me uh, get back to, uh, ba -ba, there we go. And, uh, I'm going to, uh, oh, hang in there. Okay. Reclaim host. I've reclaimed the host. John, that was that was really good. I, I think the people that will be watching this video will be extremely interested in at least how to start out with infrared. You know, yeah. it, it, it gives, it, and, and I thought, you know, like everything in photography, you can make things a lot more difficult than they really are. <laughs> and I think, with you, yeah. <laughs> And I think with your, surf, uh, your 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 simple workflow process, I think people are going to be able to see. Hey, look! If I want to get a camera converted, and I and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that they will convert just about any camera. Um, right. Yeah, they they have so much experience. They're sort of the leaders in this field. So, um, and they have an excellent website that um, will walk people through what um, are the capabilities of cameras that have been converted using different filters. Um, and they've got half a dozen different filters that you can put on your camera. I mean, what they do is they take the, the filter that comes on the camera, which filters out infrared, and they replace it with something that passes some part of the infrared spectrum. Um, and that allows you to, because the sensor doesn't care um, it can see the wavelength of infrared as well as anything else. And um, so allowing the camera to, to capture that image is all that is being done when you make this conversion. Yeah. Well, I, I, I sort of, well, you know what? I didn't really have to twist John's arm to be on. He's always a, uh, a willing guest. He's mm -hmm. a, uh, a podcast that got a lot of hits on piezography. Um, and um, he's come on here to show us some of his beginning work in infrared. John, I appreciate you being on and I thank you very much. Thank you. Fun. Take care and have a great day and do more infrared, huh? Thank you. Yeah.